I pray continually for the wisdom and the stamina needed to serve and to minister to others so that we can walk this journey with Christ together. Matthew 5.16 reminds us to let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. As a wife, my husband and I have committed to building a foundation upon the promises of God for our households. We know from Psalm 127.1 that unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. We also believe that when we stand firm and faithful, the Lord will enlarge our territory and stay with us through all of our trials and temptations. As a mom, I, leave a spiritual, I will leave a spiritual inheritance for my son. He will know what it means to have integrity, doing what is right even when no one is looking. He will have resources to grow and mature both physically and spiritually operating as a young man set apart from the ways of the world. We accept the promise in 1 Timothy 4, 8 that bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds the promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This is the legacy that I want future generations to see as valuable for making the connection between here and eternity. Our guest speaker today is someone who has gracefully modeled all of these things and created a robust legacy for me and my family. Judith Bennett, a native of Charles County, Maryland, is a certified lay servant and a member of St. Matthew's La Plata United Methodist Church under the leadership of Reverend Kevin R. Brooks. She was, for over 15 years, a member of the National Church of God under the direction of, T of the late Reverend T.L. Larry. She is happily married and blessed with three adult children and three precious grandchildren. Judy, as she is more generally known, developed a love for the Lord at an early age. She also felt a call to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Over the years, she has taken numerous Bible edu education courses, and in March of this year, completed her two-year course of study to become a certified lay minister. She has taught women's Bible studies, home Bible studies, and organized Women's Day services, as well as many other church services. She also provides outreach to the sick and shut-in, both in their homes and hospital facilities. While serving in ministry, Judy also holds a number of offices in the church. She is the lay leader to the annual conference and is the chairperson of the church staff, staff parish relations committee. Judy has a heart for people and is committed to sharing God's word in a transparent light for all to understand positively. One of her favorite scriptures is Isaiah 53, 5 but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Would you please help me welcome my mother, Minister Judy Bennett. introduction and Kingsley for your being such a gentleman to escort me to the pulpit. First giving honor to God this morning for his grace and his mercy and honor to the shepherd of this house Bishop Sweeney and First Lady to all the other ministers clergy and all visitors here today. A special happy Mother's Day to everyone. This is a beautiful day. Now, I want you all to know, I'm starting off slow, but I tend to get very excited about the Word of God. So I hope you join me as we go forth in this Word today. 
Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. I ask that you hide me behind the cross of Calvary, that your will be done and your word be presented as you intended. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today, um, I'm coming from the first chapter of Samuel. It's a very long chapter, so I want to summarize the first part, and then I'll read the scriptures I want to focus on today. Our theme today is legacy. My ser sermonic title is Legacies Are Made When We Pray. Amen? So let us go to the first chapter of Samuel. And I'm going to start at verse number nine. I'm going to skip around because, as I said, I'll summarize. So Hannah arose after they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli the priest watched her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. How many of us have made wrong assumptions? Put your wine away from you, he said. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord. I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the Lord God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. I'm going to stop right there for now, but we'll come back and visit some more. God designed us so our lives can have meaning beyond our days here on earth. God places a longing for eternal significance into each human heart, but many of us try to fill that longing by working hard to leave something of ourselves behind. God didn't place that longing there so we would be driven to accumulate great wealth or build great memorials. He gave it to us so we would be drawn to him, developing an intimacy with our only hope for lasting eternal significance. This heritage is a trust of God's great truth that we must guard carefully and intentionally, intentionally, pass on to others. If we fail to guard the truth, the legacy may become polluted with false ideas about God. And if we fail to pass the truth on to others, our godly heritage may stop with us. I don't want that to happen. I need it to go on for generation to generation. I remember as a child hearing my mother pray. She would kneel beside her bed and without shame, cry out to God, asking him to save her children, bless her family, bless her husband, and her prayers were answered. I'm happy to say that out of 11 of us, all 11 are walking with the Lord. But when at that time, as I heard her praying fervently, it frightened me. I didn't understand how can she pray so fervently? And if we did something we weren't supposed to do during the day, she called your name out specifically. So you were even in more fear. 
she, I was overcome with a strange feeling, a little bit of fear, because I knew this God, this Holy Spirit, was so powerful. But I didn't understand it at that time. My mom was a double amputee with many health issues, but she never, ever failed. No matter what church she visited, no matter at her home church, to lift her hands and praise God. You all know, men, I'm going to slight you a little bit today, but you all know once a woman sets her mind on seeking an answer from God, there is no stopping them. They will persevere despite what they see. They will walk as Hebrews 11.1 1 said. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Let's take a look at Hannah and how she travailed in prayer until the answer came and a legacy was born. As the years went by, Hannah had a rival. Her name was Penina. She was married, they were both married to the same man, Elkanah, but Hannah was barren. Penina had sons and daughters. I don't know how many the scripture says sons and daughters. So there was a rivalry. Every year as they would go up to the temple to, to offer their offerings and worships, Penina would vex Hannah. So can you imagine this barren, this emptiness in her heart, in her womb? She's still praying. She's still trusting God. But she's being vexed sore. But you know what? Hannah had self-control and grace because she forsook the reproaches of her rival. She was a woman of sorrowful spirit, but God understood her heart. See, you know, sometimes when we go through, we don't understand what's going on, but God is already at the end. He's already answering. We just have to be patient and wait on him. Our hearts are heavy. Our hearts are sorrowful. We have to go on with the day. But we know that God will answer our prayers. The Lord has shut up her womb, but her heart was still open to him. Her husband tried to comfort her. Her adversary was provoking her and insulting her but she still held on to God. Barren, she believed. In pain, she found a refuge in prayer. In God's house, she sought the creator to raise her into the empire of motherhood and to interfere with the law of nature on her behalf. How many times has God intervened on your behalf and done the impossible? Do I have any witnesses here today? Hallelujah. Her prayer was a peculiar kind of prayer. It was a supplication without external speech. Her lips moved, but there was no sound. Sometimes when we pray, sometimes when we petition, all we can do is groan in the spirit. Sometimes the words don't come forth, but God knows at heart. This was so in the temple that the priest thought she was drunk. He didn't mean to be unkind, but he was like this fervency of prayer. He didn't understand. He saw her move in her mouth, and he could not understand what was in her heart. Hannah explained herself. She declared that she had never taken strong drink. And then she poured out her soul to Eli, who discerning that her desire for a child was intense and her spirit sacrificial, for she wanted nothing for herself alone, assured her that her inarticulate, inarticulate prayer had been heard. That is the assurance that Hannah had that day. He said to her, go in peace, and the God of Israel 
grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Down she went to her house, content for her sorrowful heart hungry, forlorn heart was filled with joy. She had a promise from the Lord. God granted her wish, and the yearned for a child arrived, and she called his name Samuel, which means asked of the Lord. Hannah wasn't proud in her own strength. She wasn't boastful. Hannah relied totally on God. Hannah wanted to leave a legacy that could be talked about for years to come. Today, we are standing talking about Hannah. What a legacy she left. A legacy of being a godly woman. A legacy of being sold out for God. A legacy of not being moved when trouble comes your way. A legacy of not being intimidated when a giant of adversity or intimidation tries to rub you down. The enemy knows all things about, the, he knows about God. The enemy will try to get in, twist things around, and turn you around from your purpose. But our purpose, is to serve this mighty God. Our purpose is to love this mighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hannah's story teaches us that God can use human weakness to accomplish great things. God is looking for an open, humble heart. God is looking for a heart that will believe him in spite of what they see. Hallelujah. Her weakness, her trust in God as she turned to him, the fervency of her desire, and her faithfulness in bringing Samuel to God in, as, to God as promised are all evidences of God working in Hannah's life. Her tears were ordained to be part of the glorious story of what God was doing in Israel's history. You know, oftentimes, yesterday I taught a Bible study, and the, the topic of it was fear less. In that study, we was talking about fearing rejection, having less fear of rejection, and we talked about the tools to deal with that. But in that study, we talked about Psalms 23. And seven people in that class had a prayerful spiritual breakthrough as we read about Psalms 23. One lady had lost her dad over four years ago. She had not cried because she had wrote in her journal, Lord, help me to be strong for my mother, my sisters, my brothers, and the rest of my family. Help me to be strong, and she never cried. But tears are good. So yesterday in the study, as we read Psalm 23, she confessed that that was the psalm she kept repeating every night to get through that time when her father was dying. And in the study, she broke down. God is good. I cry a lot because I'm standing in the presence of this awesome God. My soul is humble before this awesome God. Such as Hannah, I can truly relate to her praying out to God and trusting him for the change that was to come. My legacy, I want when I'm gone for people to say, first and foremost, she loved the Lord. She was a woman of God, and she persevered. Nothing else matters. We all have accomplishments under our belts in this world. We have degrees. We have all types of things. But what is most important is that when we close our eyes and pass from this flight, we stand before this mighty God, this awesome God,
As we know, Hannah's prayer was answered. She devoted her son to the Lord and told God, if you give me this son, I will bring him back to you. So after he was weaned, that's what she did. She took him back to the temple. Can you imagine the joy in her heart when she took her son, that God, the God-given promise, the legacy, and Samuel became a mighty man. Can you imagine the joy in her heart when she went back to the temple and dedicated this child, this wonderful child that God has given her? So today, I want to encourage every mother, every father, every child. It doesn't matter what age, because in this age we live in, even the smallest children are facing situations. There's things in schools that they need the power of God to help them get through. They need to know that at the name of Jesus, hmm, demons must disappear. They need to know that when they go out in the morning, their parents have covered them in the blood of Jesus. They need to know that a hedge of protection has been placed around them. Hallelujah. Our loved ones need to know that. Our spouses need to know that. Because this world is a world of change. And if we don't leave a legacy, of a godly legacy, to carry them on so they can draw on that strength when trouble comes, where will we be? God is a mighty God. Hannah inspired me so much when I read that, and I thought, what a legacy to face this kind of conflict, this kind of time of adversity, but still hold on to God's unchanging hand. You know, God is the God of the impossible. Because if your womb is shut up, what are you going to do? But God. But God. So he defied the impossibilities. And she created a legacy that we, over 2,500, 3,000 years later, we are talking about on this day. So I want to leave you with that. I want to leave you with that encouragement. I want us to each think about the legacy that we have planned to leave for our children. Yes. We like to leave them some material things, but what we most importantly want to do is leave them the legacy of God. Let them know it's okay to cry out to the Lord. Let them know it's okay to raise your hands and praise God. Let them know that when you walk, you're not walking alone, but the angels of God are encamped round about you. Amen? Now, that is the conclusion of my message for today. I'm always mindful to be in a godly manner and observe the time frame because I believe God's will will be done, whether it's five words, ten words, or 25 words. So today, I want to invite you, if you want to come to this altar today, to agree together that you would leave a godly legacy if you feel like there's something missing in your legacy today, come forth. God is the God of right now. He can change things. He can move things out of our way. He can shut doors we don't need to go into. He can open doors that were slammed in our faces. He is the God of the apostles. So if I, anyone would like to come and agree in prayer today, Please come to the altar at this time.